Okay, everybody. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our second of our Chagas Organic Autumn webinars. And this evening's topic, we're going to look at options for organic tillage growers. Um, maybe just a few housekeeping rules in relation to uh, questions. You can put in questions at any stage into the question and answer tab. What we're going to do is we're going to let all the speakers speak and give their presentations. You can, as, as they're speaking, go ahead and put in the questions in the question and answer box. And then at the end, we'll bring everybody back and we will go through the, go through the questions and answers. So as I said, this, evening's, uh, this evening, we're looking at organic tillage grower, uh, growing options for organic tillage growers. So we have, we have all aspects of organic uh, tillage being covered here this evening. On Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Brian O'Regan from Irish Organic Feeds, could not be here this evening. But uh, we will start now. The first speaker we have this evening is Ross, Ross Jackson. Ross and Amy Jackson are farming organically just across the, the board from Awfully into Tipperary in Carrick, in County Tipperary. They are farming um, mixed enterprise, which includes cereals, uh, sheep and beef. So Ross is going to take us through from his farmer's view in relation to growing organic cereals and what, what op options and routes to market that they have taken in their organic enterprise. So Ross, over to you. Thanks very much, Elaine. So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, I suppose, yeah, look, um, again, look, I'm a farmer, as Elaine said, based in North Tipperary. And I suppose I'm just going to give you a brief overview of um, organic farming from a farmer's point of view. Um, so I suppose just what we're involved in here in the farm, we are growing a number of, of crops. We are growing um, mainly oats and barley, and um, we also have sheep and um, on, on the farm occasionally too. So the organic barley, um, we are growing for Waterford Distillery. We're growing um, oats for Flahavans. Um, we have our own lamb on the farm as well. Um, and the majority of that yeah, used to go to Irish Country Meats, and we've started up our own um, a scheme selling lamb directly off the farm as lack of organic lamb, which is going quite well. Um, and then organic beef, we haven't had beef in the last year, but when we do have beef, it goes to Good Herdsman or Slaney. And I also work as, as an agricultural consultant as well. So I, I have an insight into a lot of different um, farming uh, enterprises. So I'm going to run down through, through, through those, I suppose, and um, I suppose just um, how I go about my... Um, Organic farming is it's, it's one way of doing it. Um, I'm happy the way it's going. I went um, organic in 2015. My brother was organic for a number of years before that. And he was growing um, crops successfully and doing quite well out of it. So um, I went into partnership with my wife, uh, Amy, in 2015, and we decided to go on organic. And again, look, there's different reasons, I suppose. One, um, we were interested in the whole organic um, and again on the, the, the profitability side of things I was 100% um, organic or sorry conventional tillage and when we looked at the um, the margins in organic it just seemed a little bit more attractive than, than what we're at so I suppose just to run down through of exactly what, what the way I, I work it anyway um, so I've looked at different options of establishing um, of establishing the crops and for me um I've come to the conclusion that the only way really is, is to plow and till and sow. And for the main reason is just to bury weeds. Um, if you try and maybe um, shallow cultivate and then sow, I think some of the weeds might just get a head start. It's like maybe giving the weeds a 50 meter a head start in a 100 meter race um, and the weeds can win out. So again, once you plow, everything's going to start at the, at, the same, at the same line. I think that just um, is an advantage then from the crops just to get that um, it, they do get a head start and they are able to drown out, drown out the weeds. That's, that's the way we work it out. Look, it's, 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 plowing is, is questionable, I suppose, at the moment on a number of different environmental fronts, but as an established method for um, growing organic, um, for me, it, it's number one at the moment. And until I can be proven otherwise, um, I, I'm going to stick, stick to it. Um, other than that, I suppose, look at the timing. We, we, we can grow um, winter or spring. Um, for the barley, our um, water distillery market, um, it's spring barley, that's what they want, spring malted barley, that's what they want. Um, but for oats, we grew oats a number of years um, as a spring crop um, and doing quite well. And again, I suppose we were putting the cover crop in over the winter and that was used as forage for the lambs. 
Um, so that, that was working quite well. Um, we have moved slightly towards growing um, growing winter crops and winter varieties. Um, and we do find there is better bushel for starters. So you're, you get paid extra um, on, on bushel weight and also uh, slightly better yield as well. So um, we're happy enough. Uh, again, it keeps the weeds guessing as well that um, it's mixing up between winter and spring crops as well. So winter crops, we reckon higher yield, higher bushel, um, and maybe the allopathic effect on um, on weeds, which basically means oats, weeds, enzymes from the roots, and these actually slow um, other crops from growing, such as weeds. So that has a greater effect in winter crops. So we find that the winter established crops remain remain quite clean. I look, we have no problem getting um, anywhere between um, on a bad year, 1.8 up to two and a half ton on a good year. So that's the kind of yields we're talking about um, with organic growth. And again, um, that's that's the way we're working out. We're, we're happy enough. Um, and look, again, in my opinion, you're not going to grow a crop without good nutrition. So even though we're inorganic, um, we still have to um, put some kind of fertility back in the ground. And that's done a number of ways here. Um, whether it's slurry or dung um, and maybe growing green manures as well and putting them back in and then having a good rotation. So personally, I wouldn't like to grow tillage crop any more than three or four years before going back into, into um, a fertility building, multi-species uh, or red clover kind of a, um, or maybe again, possibly three or four years and then back into tillage. So it's too bad for your, um, your, 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 your weed control and fertility as well. So that's that's where we find it. And you can see just the picture there in the, the bottom left here. Um, what happens that crop was I had red clover in it for a number of years, taking three cuts of of um, of, of clover silage off it. And again, I didn't realize I was taking so much potassium out of the soil. And um, I did a soil test and just showed that there was um, chronic um, potassium in that. So again, that had to be rectified. Um, but look, like the crop, crop did, did quite well, but you can just see this white on the leaves um, came up you know, within very, very, very quickly. In the crop. And um, again, that may, may reduce yield. And again, it can also more likely to lodge if you've got um, that's in deficiency. Um, middle, 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 field, middle uh, picture there, again, that's a great green crop of, of, of oats, so that got plenty of dung or slurry uh, on it, and i um, happy with the results of that. Uh, so the other thing with different to winter spring crops, of course, spring crops are harvested a lot, a lot later and more likely to lodge just with, with weather and that. So we've never had a winter crop lodge, but we've generally had spring crops lodged to some extent or quite, quite an extent. Um, again, um, the picture here on the top right, Again, a good uh, nutritious looking uh, crop. Uh, um, and the bottom one then is oats that we grew this year. It's winter oats. I got um, some fertility in the winter, but it didn't get anything um, after that. And that was probably a mistake. Um, it, it yielded just, just runs. I would like to see two and a half easily for this crop, if not more, up to 2.8 if you're hoping. But again, it just ran out of, um, ran out of nutrition. Um, Still, look, it, it bushed very well. I just had to return to here. Bushed, um, bushed 60, so that's, that, that's quite good. But a bit more nutrition on that in the spring, and it would have been, would have been a much better crop. You learn as you go. Um, moving on from that, um, cover crops, we find, is an essential part of, um, of our um, tillage production, of our crop production. We started off by growing quite a range of um, diverse species from seed, my wife here, um, with the um, tillage radish, we had vetch, we had phacelia, we had different clovers, wheat, um, forage rapes, a lot of different ones in the mix. For me, if you are going down that route, you want to be in after winter crop and getting in very early with them. Um, once you, you start going into September, um, it's just forage rape, leafy turnip, and, and maybe a few tillage radishes um, are all that you're going to get much broke out of. Um, so that's, that's, that's for us. And again, it comes down to our cost thing as well. So you can see here, um, sheep, we, 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 we keep raising the sheep out then over, over the winter. They are leaving a little bit of fertility behind for the next crop. Um, moving on then, um, 
again, our rotation, I say, is it's not set in stone there. We generally put barley in first, depending on, on, on what ground we have. Um, maybe oats then for two years, maybe barley for two years, oats for two years, and then that's it. And um, back into, um, well, like you see here in the bottom, this is a multi species swart here. Um, there's TM plantain, Timothy, three or four over in it uh, this year i've planted a number of different um varieties and again just for myself just to try them out um i just actually picked up a label here earlier there's a couple of grasses moira and Aston energy moira will be a very very high yielding uh, grass red clover plantain chicory coxwood jarrow timothy parsley burnet pistolium um and then there's um sandfoin and lucerne in that as well and just to see just to see what what happens in the mix so for me it's going to go into this much species sport again for possibly at least three if not if not four years and that's going to help with the weed burden and help with the fertility and then it's back in you get a nice clean crop then we don't have much problems uh, at the moment with with weeds um depending on the year um so why did why multi-species sport will this is back in 2018 when we did have um, quite a drought and we don't get rain every week. We're nearly into a drought situation on the farm. It's just a, such a such a dry farm. So you can see big areas here are starting just, just to completely die off from, from the drought. So you can see a thistles here, deep rooting plants surviving and the, and the, and the rye grass is pretty much out. Um, so again, that's why chicory, plant, chicory plantain, red clover, all very, very deep rooting plants and will hopefully survive the drought a little bit better. Um, other crops then that we, we've grown on the farm, I've grown lupins on the farm before, use oats for sheep. I've grown peas before. You can see here, great yield off the peas. Um, one year I put them in the pit, another year I put them in the, um, I, I bale them. Um, we've grown um, beans before, and um, my brother has grown, um, for, for, for a couple of years as well. So again, I suppose look just to touch on, on our markets, barley there, as you can see, um, that's probably one we're probably getting um, quite well, we're getting quite well paid on the barley and the oats. Um, and it's great just to have the rotation there to have both the barley and the oats contracts that we can, we can have rotation between our barley and our oats back into grass and start a rotation again. Again, I mentioned before, yields 1.5 to 2 ton, 2.2 ton for the barley. Um, and again, for us, barley is a bit more of an open crop sometimes, and it can lead to weeds coming in later in the year. So a couple of weeks before harvest when the crop is dying down, we do tend to get, um, the weeds tend to come up then. And for us, we were saying, look, we have our own combine, um, or other than that, you need a very reliable contract. So that, field is ready to cut and use but if you wait one two three weeks after it needs needs to be cut those weeks can come up and we should pretty much pull down the crop and it can be written off we've seen plenty of crops written off so again when the crop is ready it's essential just to go in and get a cut it's you know, even broken weather for um, a couple of weeks weeds can come up very very quickly um oats then is another main main market again and they look we get great yields from the oats well, probably the easiest crop to grow in organic, the most reliable crop to grow. Um, again, weeds can be an issue in harvest. Not so much again in the winter, we find more so in the spring. Um, and again, we, we're trying to keep the weeds guessing whether we're going to change between spring crops and winter crops and barley. Um, and again, we find that that seems to work, work quite well. But crops generally staying quite clean. We just find in the last couple of weeks, um, any weeds that are there will come up when I down and like it's good. Uh, so again, I think we'd love to see a little bit more research and training into um, different types of weeds and their life cycles and um, see how we can, can reduce um, the weeds in our crop. Look, that'd be great for, for venture side of things, not having to put out any 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 any, any fungicides. Um, moving on from that then, I suppose, look, the organic lamb um, I mentioned already. Um, most were going to ICM more and we started up our own. We're getting roughly 10 euros a head more for the um, organic lamb going down the, um, at the ICM, which pretty much pays for the extra cost of the meal. So it's not um, that lucrative, um, but it's great as a breaking, great for, for weeds 
for as well. So another reason for, for having the sheep. Um, we started up our selling, selling off the farm. Our first year, we aimed to sell maybe 20 lambs, and that was last year, and over 100 lambs were sold off the farm. And basically, the point of the butcher was the half lamb or whole lamb. That's, that's um, very successful. Um, and again, the beef side of things, again, I believe you need some kind of rotation in, a, in organic. So whether it's beef or sheep or whatever you have um, that you're putting on, on the grassland, uh, beef, look, store beef prices, some years are, are, are easy to buy, they're similar to convention, other years are, are, are uh, very, very expensive. Prices in organic, I suppose, look, at the moment, convention prices are so good, it doesn't make organic look that good. Um, but in some years, convention prices could be 350, 360 a kilo, and the organic could be up at 470, 480. So they're around 480 now, but a conventional man can probably get 440 for his um, own stock. Again, the 480, say, or whatever is at the minute, is an all in price. Whereas if you see uh, the conventional, a 420, for example, that's a base price you get on that. Um, there is a bit of an issue in the, in the beef side of things as well, that it can be hard to get your cattle killed. Um, it's just that you book in six months in advance. So that's quite difficult. And now they're saying, look, if you're booking in cattle for the autumn time of the year and everyone wants to do it, you say, look, you're booking so many cattle in the autumn. Ideally, we want you to kill so many in the spring as well. So that's, um, I suppose, it's more, not more difficult to, to get finished in spring. You're probably looking at feeding meals and, and that kind of a thing. Um, environmental benefits, then, we're, we're nearly done. Um, we do find a lot of environmental benefits on the farm. Um, I'm sure most of you will recognise what, what these are. This is the, the beans here, and these are all the aphids on the, um, on the bean stalk. And again, the virus conventional, First thing you'll be doing is running out for the square and getting these guys um, with, your, with your aphicide. And of course, that's going to kill plenty of other things along the way. So again, we couldn't spray it. And we came along then a couple of weeks later, and these little guys were all over uh, eating the aphids. And anybody who would probably recognise these um, as uh, lady bird larvae. So these guys were everywhere. So it's great to see uh, these. And I presume if we had to spray them, they wouldn't have survived. Um, so then, look, we're just getting on to, I suppose, um, promotion. Um, I know Flavins and Water Sue do great promotion on, on their products uh, and fair play to them. Um, that's why, why they are as successful uh, as they are. Um, beef and sheep, we feel that maybe a little bit more needs to go in on probably um, a national basis. In the likes of Copenhagen, there, they say up to 90% of meals served in public identities were organic. In Ireland, that's probably quite, quite low. Um, Warford Distillery then have done a video here on um, on us when uh, as growers. So again, that can be seen there. Just, just organics into YouTube or whatever you'll find is about a ten minute video. And um, if you can sit through that, <laughs> fair play to. You. And um, again, look, that's basically it for me, Elaine. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to happy to ask. But probably gone way over time there as it is. No, that's fine. Listen, uh, Ross, thank you very much there. Um, an excellent overview and your own experience and the various aspects of growing our organic cereals and your routes to market. So uh, we leave the questions till the end. Maybe is there a question? Uh, maybe take a question while our, I introduce our second speaker. Speaker. Yeah, I'll just throw one question out to you there, Ross. Uh, one question here is you said that one of the oat crops struggled after the red clover and uh, someone is asking how many years was the red clover uh, in in for there? The red clover was in for, for uh, three years and I was probably taking three cuts a year off that. So that probably, now look, I was going back out with slurry and that, but obviously, obviously not enough. I thought soil industries were, were good enough at the time. And when I went back, you can see it straight away in the, in the leaf of the, of, of, of the crop there that it was, it was quite low in potassium. Okay, okay. our you. next two speakers, I'm going to introduce you to James and Johnny Flahaven of uh, Flahaven's uh, Kilnagrange Mills in County Waterford. And as a lot of you may know, uh, Flahaven's have been processors of organic oats for a number of years. And James and Johnny are going to give us an overview on uh, the, in relation to organic oats, in relation to quality varieties and market demand from where they're coming from on the processing side. So I think James, you're going to start off and then Johnny will take over from that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks, Elaine. Um, yep. So yep. I'm just starting to share here, here now. Yes. And just put it onto the slideshow. Yeah. Um, 
So um, yeah, Perfect. thanks, thanks, Elaine, for for having us tonight. Yeah. So my name is 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 James uh, Flavin, and uh, and Johnny, my brother, will be speaking. Um, you know, the last the last part of the presentation. So um, just what we were looking to cover off this evening was a couple of topics. Um, so one was around the kind of the old supply. Um, so what what um, you know has been coming in for the last number of years. Then talk a little bit about market demand, uh, and then uh, going into um, some of the investments that we've made recently. Uh, and then um, Johnny will be talking about the quality, some of the quality aspects um, that are important to us. And then we'll be going into just the outlook for harvest 22 and and onwards and then and then there's a couple of of frequently asked questions um that that have come up recently um that we're just going to cover off and then obviously yeah, any questions that people have for for during the presentation um can put them into the q a box um so so yeah for people that don't know us yeah flavins we're a, we're a, a food producer a processor of um conventional and organic uh oats oats is our kind of main product um but more and more recently uh organic has been becoming a larger part of our overall business so conventional is still is still larger than organic but but every year that gap seems to be getting um smaller and smaller um so just moving on then to the to the supply side um so this is the uh, this is the last number of years um, of organic oats that that have been coming into us. So uh, I've just broken it into two. So the Irish market is is the bottom one. So that's the red uh, the red bars. So for the last number of years, dating back to twenty eighteen and prior to that, the the maximum we were getting in the Irish market was about three thousand tons per year. Um, and we have been highlighting, you know, back then that that you know we weren't we're not getting enough uh, organic oats from the from the Irish market, and that we you know we, we were having to to bring them in from from the UK um, uh, to meet to meet the demand that that was that was there for the product. Um, so that was where the shortfall would have come in, and we you know we we have done. Uh, you know, a number of presentations and, and and things like that to try and increase the encourage the growing of of Irish organic oats, and and I suppose that that's kind of come to bear fruit in the years twenty nineteen and twenty twenty. So we had some good good increases in in both the number of growers and the the amount of organic oats that we were receiving. And by nature, then uh, we were having to reduce the number of purchases we were making from from uh, from abroad as well. Uh, I suppose to you know we we were kind of surprised about how how much the the supply from the Irish side increased though in in 2021. Um, I think you know back in back in May time we would have been anticipating that it might have been about six thousand tons, six and a half thousand tons that we were expecting to get from the Irish market. But actually, what transpired was that we got uh, over nine and a half thousand tons, um, you know, so there was a lot of organic oats out there that, you know, we weren't um, that, that we weren't aware of that was being that was being grown. I suppose, you know, we're delighted to say that we are um, 100 percent self-sufficient now for the for the Irish market um, for, for this year. Uh, when you look back at the previous years, we were only we were only about 50 percent self-sufficient, uh, although it had been increasing the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, the, the increase that we see saw from 2020 into 2021 was up 78 percent. Um, so so if you look at it, it was, you know, nearly 4000 tons of Irish grain, uh, Irish organic oats was added in, in that one year span, which if you go back was the entire Irish oats crop from 2019 was added in, in 2021. So I suppose, you know, um, you know, we, we, we had probably anticipated that this would take us a number of years. It would be a journey of a number of years to get that sort of quantity from the Irish market, but we seem to have gotten there, um, you know, a, a lot sooner. Um, so, you know, that's great for the consumers that we're able to, you know, go out and say that it's a, 
it's 100% um, Irish grown uh, organic oats now. Um, just moving on. To, so that's that's just a bit about the supply side. Um, in terms of the uh, demand, um, so where where is the demand coming from? Um, I thought it was interesting maybe just to give, give an outlook here uh, as to how much of it is domestic versus uh, how much of it is export. James seems to have frozen there. Yeah, it looks like he might have. Um, do you want to take over? Do you want to take over? Your... I he's sharing, but if you give me a moment, I can share from my screen. Give me two seconds. Let's go and take a couple of questions on the um, yes, on the going side of things. No, are we good to go there? Yep, Johnny. Yep, uh, I'm, I'm sharing from my side now. Just give me a second, perfect. Okay, so I guess James has walked you through a little bit about this supply, and I guess to his next slide, um, he was talking through the organic oats demand. Oh, James, are you back on again? Yeah, yeah, I'm back here now. Uh, I don't okay. know what happened there. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, continue on there. If you want to just click on one, Johnny. So yeah, I was just saying about the, the demand then on the domestic side, you can see the, the line is quite moderate in terms of its growth. Um, you know, it's up to about 1,500 tonnes. And this is finished product now. So there, there's a yield loss, a milling yield loss. So that's why the numbers won't exactly correlate with the numbers on the previous slide. Um, but the uh, so it's about a thousand thousand five hundred tons of finished product in the Irish market. With but you can see where the majority of the demand now is is in exports. Um, so that that line has been growing uh, at a much faster rate. Um, so you can see now for twenty twenty one um exports is probably double what the domestic market is 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 required for so i suppose yeah like where is that demand in terms of export it's majority of it is the uk i'd say maybe 90 percent 80 to 90 percent of that is is uk market um uh, there have been a couple of challenges in relation to brexit uh, a few things that have yet to materialize as well um, so one of those being um, around certificates of inspection, uh, which which is a, which is unique to organic uh, products, which is due to come in. It's been pushed back a couple of times now. It was originally due to come in in July, then it was moved to December, and now it's back to July of 2022 uh, is when it's due to come in. Um, we're still having to do um, you know additional customs clearances. Uh, things like that, which which make it a little bit more challenging, but we still see a lot of. Well, we're still hopeful that there's there's more upside in in the in the UK market. Um, so we're 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 working on on that side. Um, if you want to move on, then Johnny. Um, so uh, yeah, so now it's it. One of the things that we've put in as well is. To be able to cope with the additional volumes coming into the into the facility, um, we we uh, felt we, we found that our existing organic bins uh, we didn't have capacity to cope with the demand, the extra demand that was coming in. So we added a new bin there um, earlier this year, and that has capacity for an additional thousand five hundred tons. Um, so so you can see, you know, with the with the the, the volumes coming in, um, we needed to add in some some level of infrastructure there, um, you know, and I suppose it's a kind of a, a sign of our continued commitment to the to the organic market as well, um, and you know, and that that's going to continue next year and the year after as well. So we have other items that we're planning to 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 improve and upgrade um, as well as part of that process. So that was that was it from me. Um, I think there'll, there'll probably be some questions, but I'll pass over to Johnny now. Thanks, James. Okay, um, so I guess from, from my side, um, my name is Johnny Flavin. Um, 
and I want to talk a little bit about the Harvest 21. So I guess there's three things that have been flagged to me that have been especially important this year. Um, that's yield, quality, and price. And what I've been told is that in a typical year, you would normally only have two of those three, but this is the first year in many that all three have aligned. And so I think that for lots and lots of our growers out there, they've been very, very satisfied with the 2021 harvest, as have Lavins. Um, I want to flag a couple of things just to, to the growers on the call here. Um, something that Flavins have been kind of involved in and liaising with is an update on mycotoxins. This is T2 and HT2. So this is FDI and IBC, that's the Food and Drink Ireland and the Irish Breakfast Cereal Association. There is a conversation happening at an EU level talking about levels of mycotoxins in cereals. Now, they're looking to introduce them for oats, and that's the one that we're obviously getting, you know, we're, we're giving quite a lot of contributions to. Um, but just something to flag, and this is something we'll, we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on in future, is that the, these limits are likely to be coming in in the next couple of years. Um, they'll apply to organic and conventional products together. And, and one thing that we're going to ask as part of our kind of go forward on this is that um, we'll ask for oats to be delivered quite swiftly to Flahavins once they're harvested. Now, there's no, I don't think there's any determined specific factor that causes mycotoxins, but I've, I've flagged there in a box to the right just a couple of conditions and factors that can lead to higher levels of mycotoxins. That is, you know, wet conditions, late harvest, a cooler summer, or indeed damp storage. So those four conditions, I mean, the Irish and the UK climate particularly can be susceptible to having higher levels of mycotoxins. And anecdotally, we, we have tested product coming in and they have been at levels in and around where these limits will be in the future. Uh, just a, a very quick analysis on some of the seed varieties. Now, Flahavins have asked for Husky, Isabel and Barra varieties going into Harvest 22. Um, from the charts here, this is a snapshot that was mid-harvest for eight and a half tonnes. But what we're pointing out here is that Husky and Isabel, they were, they were a much more dominant seed than we received otherwise. Uh, but also that we identified that there's a, a better bushel between the Husky and Isabel versus what are the Barra, Delphin um, uh, and, and, and content. Uh, just something else to point out on the moisture, this is something people will probably be familiar with, but just, just, just to identify, um, on the moisture side, we just picked out that Ulster and Connacht typically provide oats with a higher moisture content than, than Munster and Leinster, but that's something that would be typical of those climates. Okay. Uh, moving on, to, this is something that we wanted to spend a bit of time talking about, um, and something that we did, we have had questions about so far this year, and we'll be talking about it a little bit further. Um, James already pointed out that we, uh, as of 2021, the first bar on this chart is our supply line, which was in the order of nine, nine and a half thousand tons. Now, what we've done is we've issued contracts in 2022 for approximately 10,000 tons. And what I want to point out here is that we're looking to get confirmation back on the demand uptake for these contracts in next year. Now, we've had 76% of our volume confirmed for next year. And so we're just waiting for people to come back with their responses to allow us to plan into next year. Now, I want to go on to the next slide with just a couple of questions that, I guess, leading on from the previous slide, just to, I guess, try and, try and preempt some of the questions I'm anticipating in the, in the comment box afterwards. Um, first one is, and these are questions we have fielded quite a lot of so far this year. Um, this is one where, where farmers are rotating crops between 2021 and 2022, asking a question if their allocation will be maintained for the continuing years. Now, Flavins, we're fully aware that in any farming scenario, there will be rotations in crops. So we're anticipating that. We're trying to be fair to all the growers that have been with us through the organic journey. And so we're trying to maintain continuity with that. Now, what we would ask, however, is that if you are going into rotation and you're looking to grow fewer acres than you would have done previously, then we would ask that you communicate that to us so that we can then plan for our 2022 intake supply. The second question, I guess, leading on from that is where we've got people who've, who've approached Flahavens and they're in the process of conversion to organic um, and asking if they can supply in next year. So what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to understand what our supply side is looking like for 2022 from the existing growing panel. 
And then what we're doing is we're creating a waiting list for any of those suppliers hoping to, 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 to supply in 2022. So we're creating that list. We're asking people to get in touch and to let us know that they are intending or hoping to be able to supply. And then once we know what our kind of our supply is looking like for 2022, then we'll be able to reach out again and confirm. Uh, a last question. This is just one. So a couple of comments I had last week where a couple of the growers suggested they were looking at getting grant aid to provide to, to, to construct drying and grain storage and asking how that would be dealt with from Flavins. Um, we have our own storage. We have our own dryers. We've got a very premium product and how we manage and maintain it. So we're not at this point looking to offer any premium pricing on that. So yeah, and that's a couple of things and that's gonna leave it there for now. Um, so thank you, Elaine. Um, thank you, James and Johnny for that, for that overview from, in relation to your, in relation to your quality varieties and market demand. And I, I suppose we might just leave the questions until the end because we have Mark and Michal to introduce them and get them going. Mark, I'm going to introduce you now to Mark Gillanders and Michal Rafferty, who are two organic farmers from County Monaghan, who have been were, have been farming independently, but have come together and they have started to started to uh, grow, mill and start selling their own flour from their own, grown in their own fields under the label Irish Organic Mill Limited. So I'm going to hand you over all, first of all, to Mark, who is going to go through this first part of the presentation in relation to growing the crop and getting it ready for milling. And then Michal will come in and tell us all about the milling aspect. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Elaine. Um, I wonder, could we knock it back? I think that's slide number four. Um, so it is. Okay. Can, we, Can we go back to slide? Just. Or maybe, maybe it's the introductions. And... Go, yep. There. That's working. Perfect, perfect. So go ahead there, Mark. What I'm I'm still seeing slide number four. I are you? We have slide number one here, the, the first slide showing. Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, that's it. Yeah. And two. Knock on, knock on. Yeah. Um Very slow. We have a time delay. Time delay. Yeah. There's a long, long distance between Limerick and Monaghan. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, we are, um, me and Rafferty and, and Martin and myself, um, we're uh, started to mill our own flour um mill our own flour from wheat we have harvested um so we have a separate standalone food grade flour mill in a food hub in a place called bala bay in county monon so um we're certified with ioa we're um we're looked at consumer demand for low low environmental organic food so um, basically, we wanted to bring our own produce to market, and as such, um, see where the where it would go from there. So um, what we've got is low food miles versus the amount of imports that's imported into this country. Um, I think Michal will touch on those later, but um, what are point is locally grown, locally milled, um, farmer owned and truly sustainable farmed with nature product. So I can flick on. Um, so um, Limerick, Limerick's getting it's slow down there. It's taking a bit of time to get through, is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Basically, uh, I've been growing cereals here on the farm um, since 2010, organic cereals. So uh, the next step was to bring it, bring it that wee bit further. Um, what, what I have learned over the last 10 and 12 years would be um, 
that he can farm without all of it. Now, I wasn't a conventional tillage grower. I am coming from a beef background, coming from sucklers to beef, finishing beef. Um, and basically Monaghan isn't known for for um, growing cereals. Well, not this last 30, 40 years anyway. Maybe 30, 40 years ago it was it was uh, there was a lot more um, cereals grown in Monaghan. But what we find growing a natural product um, is the fertility and the rotations um, really build up build up quality in the in the grain. Like for instance, we had um, really good quality this year with bushel weights up on eighty eight kph, um, which is really good for getting loads of white flour and traditionally stone grinding it. Um, so basically we'd like to see more promotion of Irish organic food and farmers um, working with the premium end of the, of the, of the, of the um, organic um, cereals. So um, basically to get where we have got, we have done a lot of trial, a lot of error. Well, not that much error, actually, but um, my rotation would sort of be um, growing wheat first, followed by oats, um, followed by a combi crop. And this year we tried beans grown with wheat because usually it was a, it was a pea mix grown with wheat but um, limited availability of what we wanted. So, um, but also growing a bean that um, stands up really well and has really early uh, ripening, um, has really increased our wheat in the rotation. So um, the amount of, Imports that is coming in in flour is pretty much unreal. So that's our selling point as well. I'm maybe going over myself a wee bit. But um, soil, what we do here, we have two years of multi species pasture or red clover, which is um, then followed by five years of spring cereals. So as I said, wheat first, oats second, combi crop third. And we can go out fourth on another combi crop fifth. And it seems to be working out really well. Um, what we're doing is as most sort of longer term, even getting into the um getting into the full-time tillage or you know, continuous tillage organic, uh, would be adding uh, the likes of your farmyard manure, the likes of slurries in the autumn time and sticking with sticking with the um sticking with spring cereals up around here so um we have trialed a good few milling weights and they seem to be working very well so far so we can flick it on to number five has um, moved for me yeah i have it now as well pardon this on the imports now is on Yeah. Do you want to take over there, Michal? Has it come up for you yet, Mark? Yeah. It's on um, Ireland yeah. Imports. Yeah, perfect. Go for it. Yeah. Well, I, you can yeah. That's what we're taking in there at the moment. So, in a uh, flower that's coming into Ireland. Now, there'd be a small proportion of that organic, but um, it just goes to show that a nation that would be you know, known for its exports. What we are importing in flour is is pretty much unbelievable. So um, if you can flick it on there. I suppose if I wanted to talk to uh, talk about a few options in um in other than wheat, um spelt and possibly rye. There can be a few problems um with rye in regards to ergo, ergot. 
Um, but um, spelt is a really good option. I guess there's not enough of it grown in Ireland either. Um, it's another option of uh, so the screens are really flicking about on me here. Maybe I don't know why I'm, I'm getting it. What getting slide it. am I meant to be on there, Mark? Sorry. Yes. I'm on eight anyway. And which one am I meant to be on? Um, I think eight anyway. We'll work yeah. with that. Was the, eight, the, eight. the import's not behind or ahead of? Yeah. Uh, the, the imports, there's there's the one with the labels is before that, slide seven. Right. Sorry, right. Uh, I probably threw that one in. It was just on the green leaf. Um, so... I suppose when anyone's looking at their flowers, um, you know, for organic, um, you know, the green leaf is usually the EU symbol that's used. And it's important just to highlight there that where it says Ireland agriculture, um, when you're, you know, in a store or in a bakery or whatever, and you're asking about where the flowers come from, there's a requirement when you use the green leaf that you must state that it's come from Ireland. So, and the, the code, the Article 58 of the, the EU regulation says that the place where the agricultural raw material that makes up the product has been farmed must be displayed in the same visual feed as the EU green leaf. So in some cases, you'll see Ireland here, Ireland agriculture. In other cases, you'll see EU agriculture. And in other cases, you'll see EU, non-EU agriculture. So I guess there's probably um, a little bit there about informing the consumer who's buying flour about whether it's Ireland or whether it's EU or whether it's non-EU and um, that the use of the green leaf which most people would associate with organic products has that stipulation in it that you must state um, where the product has been farmed so it's not where it's been packed or where it's been preferred or processed it, it must be where it's farmed so that's just an important stipulation there on the packaging um, so that you can see as it actually come from Ireland or as it come from the EU or non-EU. Back to you, Mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess you want to move it on? Seems I'm back on eight again. Yeah. Yeah, you want to go to nine, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, we could, we could. Um, okay, let's skip on again. You're on harvesting and drying oh, no, there. That's, that's probably all right. That's given a, just a wee bit of an overview of um, of of where we should be going. Um, yeah, just basically, I'll give you a wee rundown on harvesting. Um, the grain should be dried within 24 hours. Um, the wheat coming in off the field. Basically, to preserve protein, to preserve um, quality of the grain, you may be cutting it just that wee bit earlier. We, we're using spring weights. So it's usually around that first week of September we're cutting them, and they could be anywhere, they could be anywhere up to 26, 27% moisture. So um, to preserve the quality of them, you do need to go in with our Irish weather. You do need to go in that wee bit earlier and not take a risk on leaving them too late. It's the same as the barley there with Ross. Um, the crop needs to be cut, but you don't have that. Um, you don't have that with wheat. You can, it's only the quality you're preserving. You don't have, wheat is fairly rigorous at, at, at competing with weeds or that. So um, basically that's fairly, fairly simple. Um, simple uh, messages there on that slide. So um, you need to be fairly accurate. We're dry, drying, the, drying the grain down to um, in the region of 13% moisture um, within 24 hours um, and storing it, storing it well, keeping it, keep it making sure it goes cold, um, completely cold after the after the um dry in process but um these are the risk factors as well as the mycotoxins 
is an OTA mold. Um, basically, your store your storage is wrong if you're getting that to a certain ex- to a certain extent. You've been picking up mycotoxins and increasing those mycotoxins. Um, as again, germination, sprouting. So that's why we're going in that wee bit earlier, cutting it and drying it quickly. Um, but you, you get a, a lot of those problems are completely um, completely eradicated whenever you're doing that procedure. Um, basically, all yeah, that's fairly fairly. I think Michal's going to take over eleven. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, just on the indicative safe storage, I suppose, look, um, don't anybody um, send us an email if these dates don't hold right for you. Um, but this, the, the risk factors are um, the mycotoxins, the OTA mycotoxin, which is a different mycotoxin to the the, the earlier one that, that the guys in Flavins were, were, were speaking about. Um, and that's one of the risks, the germination risk, as Mark said, and there's also risks of insects and mites. Um, and it's important to remember that wheat is a living grain and it respires, you know, so it sort of breeds. And as it breeds, it gives off a small amount of heat. And as the as the heat increases in a, a grain pile, um, if you're in flat storage, you know, the temperature will continue to rise and so will the moisture content. And, you know, in very extreme cases, it can turn black. And if it's left unchecked, it can cause a fire. Um, so we've just sort of give some rough guidelines here. So if you've dried your grain down to 13 percent moisture, 13 degrees and then add 13 percent moisture, so the temperature and the moisture at 13, um, then you should be OK in theory to for about 100 days. So the OTA risk should be OK for 100 days, germination OK. So they're all OK for 100 days, at which point then you'd be looking to turn the grain. Um, in the next, the second column, if you're at, your grain temperature is at 13 degrees, but your moisture, and you've only dried it to 15 degrees, you can see that the first three are still okay, but your mites risk um, will start developing at 60 days. So when that starts at 60 days, then it basically means you've got to turn the, 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 the grain at 60 days. Um, if you get to a situation then where your moisture is at 15% and your the temperature of your grain is at 15 degrees, then the mites problem actually starts 20 days earlier, so as opposed to 40 days, and that means you need to be turning the grain at 40 days. And if you're then moving to 16% moisture and 16 degrees um, is the temperature in the grain, you can see that the insect risk uh, starts to develop. Uh, it goes from 100 days down to 52 days. So in the third column, you can see if you're 15 degrees and 15% moisture, you're potentially okay for 100 days, but if both of those two items tick up 1%, the insect risk immediately comes in at 52 days. Um, so those are important things. That basically means then the mites are down to 40 days. You've got to turn turn the, the grain at 40 days. So these are just indicative figures, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, just moving on to the mill and wheats themselves. Um, there's many, many different types of flowers. Um, there's many, many different types of, of wheat. Um, Broadly speaking, there's winter sown and spring sown. And as Mark said, we've sort of settled on the idea of the spring. Um, and um, it gives us sort of a chance um, in the autumn to um, carry out some maintenance in the fields and nutrients to, to replenish nutrients. There's hard and soft uh, wheats. And, the, you know, a wheat is regarded as hard if the endosperm, which is the, the white texture inside the grain, if it's sort of you know, a hard texture um, or it's a soft texture. So there's different wheats that would uh, give those characteristics. Um, a wheat can be strong or weak. And I suppose a strong wheat would typically give you a strong flour. Um, so you hear some people saying that they, they want to use a strong white flour for their bread. And that would have to be coming from a strong wheat variety. Um, the other things that you typically check um, on your wheat is the visual appearance of it whether there's any type of smell, um, if there's a must of some type, um, you know, that'll be a cause for concern. Moisture, um, again, you know, same with the guys in Flavin, it's very, very important. Um, protein is important for us um, in, in terms of, of, you know, the, the, the crude protein. 
but there's another protein um, test, which is around the quality of the protein. So, you know, if you've got a wheat that's kicking out 13% protein, that's great. But there's also, you need to test the quality of the gluten in that uh, protein to make sure that it's got good elasticity um, and it can perform well in baking. Um, HFM is short for Hagberg falling number. That measures the enzyme activity, the alamase activity inside the grain. That's very important, um, again, for baking. Um, and, you know, wheats that would have a higher score with Hagberg will be suitable for bread making. Ones that are lower scores would probably be more suitable for um, batter, um, maybe things like uh, biscuits and um, shortbreads, pizzas, those types of things. Um, the hectolitre weights, again, it's similar to the other guys, um, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, oats would probably be in the, the in the 50s and 60s. Uh, for us, for bread making, you must be above 76, um, 75, 76. And as Mark said, this year we've been absolutely incredible, the results we've gotten, and we'll come to, to, come to that as well. Screenings um, and admixtures would be the same. And um, you're trying to keep your screenings and your admixtures down below one and a half percent. And as came up earlier, mycotoxins and food safety limits are really, really important. And um, there are limits in place for OTAs. And um, it's very important that that you stay on the, on the right side of those. But um, very important, you know, moisture and storage um, very important on those. And um, the other things to watch out are for peculiarities within the grains. Um, and as Mark said, things like ergot are an automatic rejection. Um, so ergot, there's unfortunately zero tolerance in relation to ergot. Um, on the this, just just to touch on this, um, the moisture typically the bread spec is for 13% moisture, late 10 to early 11s for protein, Hagberg falling number to be 240 and the um, bushel weight to be about 76. Um, the latest results that we've got in um, are that the moisture on the drying has been between 12 and 13 percent, which is sort of a sweet spot for the type of milling that we do. Um, our proteins have come in at 10.9 up to 13.3, which we're very pleased with. Um, the one that did catch us a bit uh, of a big surprise was the Hagberg. Um, and you know maybe the sun just came out at that right time during the summer, um, and we've scored two seventy four on on those. And in fact, those samples actually would go through a further cleaning process in production that would probably bring that number potentially up even more. So very pleased with that. And the hectolitre weight, as Mark says, came in at eighty seven. I'm not sure if my score was higher than Mark's, but look, we were there thereabouts. Um, so we're very very pleased with those results. There are other things that come into, into play, like um, starch damage and water absorption, but we won't go into that too much. Um, flour milling, there's roughly two types of flour mills. Um, steel roller mills that can have up to five breaks in the system, um, and they can have different types of flours that are broken down different ways, and they go, can go into plant sifters and all into purifiers, and there's a very, very detailed uh, production process um, in some of the larger mills. Um, we use traditional stone ground milling and we thought when we were looking at this, because we were going for an organic premium uh, end of the market, we thought it would be better to go for stone milling, which is the traditional way um, that um, flour would be made. And uh, that basically you've got two stones that rotate at speed and they basically grind uh, the, the, the grain and give you the, the outputs of the endosperm, which is mostly the white of the, the grain. Then you've got um, the bran and you've got um, the, the semolina coming out. And um, usually we use a pneumatic transport system uh, to move the flour around the, the, the facility. Um, so that's an air transport system. And uh, so we, we have, you know, air locks and all that type of thing in the system. And then you're looking at bagging and dispatch. So those that's roughly how it looks. This is just a shot of um, our bag that would go to the home bakers who order online. Um, we would do a five kilo bag, and this is basically what a five kilo bag looks like at the moment. And we're hoping to have a, a bag for retail, hopefully in the next 10 days or so. Um, and that will be a one kilo bag. 
um, or thereabouts. So we sell stone ground organic plain flour, um, a wholemeal flour. We also do semolina, which is very good for um, pasta and for couscous. And um, we're looking at other products as well um, to, to try and expand our range. I guess for the, ch the, the challenges and opportunities that we see ahead, um, I suppose it's great that um, there's been some additional funding, um, significant funding announced um, for our organics going forward. And the things that we're sort of putting out there that we'd like to be able to talk to, to, to folks about is, you know, knowledge transfer for organic tillage. Um, so, you know, we, we're all sort of talking between ourselves, but I suppose we need to try and find a way to to uh, formally um, help people. And I know Chagas have been doing some um, KTs for organics. Um, we'd like to try and get a situation where, you know, we've got a good input in terms of the, the research that's getting done. Um, that's both for growing um, and also on the food side and on the other side. Um, in terms of the marketing, I think marketing, as, as Ross alluded to, you know, marketing is so important. And um, I think it's important that the, the, the funding for the promotion of the organic sector in Ireland and the, the promotion and marketing of the products that are being produced by farmers here is ring fenced. And there's really, really strong momentum put behind that so that the, the sector can grow, um, not just in land, but also in the value of the products that are there. The soil sampling scheme, um, you know, I suppose organic farmers, the soil, Ross said it earlier, is really, really important. You don't realise we're a problem until you can see uh, there's no crop where there's supposed to be two tonnes to the acre. So we'd be looking to really try and proactively um, tackle the problems that we've got with looking at organic matter or hummus levels in, in soil. And maybe, you know, organic farmers possibly need a, an individual um, module within the soil sampling scheme to help us. Um, as the guys in Flavin said, there's a huge capital cost involved in, in everything we're doing, both at the farm level and in the mill. Um, and uh, we're hoping that the, the, the expansion in organics will be demand-led. Um, things like the Food Dudes programme um, that's been run. And we'd like to maybe see organic um, cereals um, being, being, being included in that programme for, for schools. And packaging, you know, there's, there's a, our customers on the organic side don't like plastic and you know we've got to be looking at innovative packaging solutions and um, for our customers who don't want to use um plastic um and then you know trying to get new technologies um so that's it elaine and uh, our website is there for for anyone to have a look at and our email address and our twitter details and, and all that is there so thanks elaine Thank you very much and really a very comprehensive uh, overview from Mark sowing the seed in the ground to Michal putting the flower in the bag. So thank you very much for that. Maybe we, we have a lot of questions coming in and as I say, if anybody wants to continue putting in questions, feel free to do so. So maybe Joe, will you start with some of the questions? That we have mm -hmm. we James and Ross there. Can you come back? Yep, James and Ross. Um, yep, a lot of these questions uh, came in as you were speaking. So, Ross, I think you were kind of the first blast of them are coming towards you. Uh, first question here is a, it's a very specific question, but can a pacoman, uh, uh, sorry, can a pacomat or furrow press use the plow and reduce the oxidation of organic matter at plowing? Uh, does anyone uh, do you want to? Can you answer that one, or is it anyone else want to have a shot at it? Well, look, plowing is seen to be producing a lot of oxidation and, and lots of organic matter. Would it help? I, I can only guess slightly. I don't think it's going to make a massive a massive difference. I don't know if anyone else has any comment on that. Mark, would you have any comment on that there from your experience? I wouldn't really have tried, wouldn't really have tried to test the likes of it. You know, you need to have a fair wee bit of testing done yeah. on comparisons, yes. you know. Yes. So yeah. basically. Yes. Okay, yeah. Next one there, Ross, for you is uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation there was a potassium deficiency and someone is asking here, how did you rectify the potassium deficiency? Uh, so in organic, there are some chemical fertilizers you can use, such as patent Cali. So patent Cali is a, phosphor, is a potassium based uh, fertilizer. And that was used to bring up the um, potassium along with slurry as well. Perfect. Uh, again, Ross, for you, did you ever undersow cereals with clover? I did. I tried both red and white clover, but uh, it's funny. Um, I started doing derogation courses, which brings a smile to people's faces because that's people who are uh, very highly stocked, up to 250 kilos per hectare. So I'm running courses for these guys. And over that, we're down in more in uh, Park and we're 
getting trained up. And they say that white clover, anyway, doesn't start fixing nitrogen for at least 12 to 18 months. So under sowing a crop with clover, and I've tried it, and I've seen trials from it, it's, it doesn't work because it's not fixing nitrogen. And again, from that, you see you need quite a lot of clover in the swore to produce a decent amount of nitrogen as well. So for me, I've tried that. Um, and unless other scientific bases come out that, that red clover fixes a bit quicker or whatever, but red, red clover can get very high and cause um, uh, harvesting issues as well. So again, no, I won't be doing that in the future. Now maybe in cover crops, what put me inside, but uh, no, I don't think um, I don't think I'll do that again. Have you That's any it. experience, maybe Mark as well? Do you want to say anything from your? Uh, I haven't. I haven't really grown clover, but with the combi crop, and uh, I do really feel that there's nitrogen being fixed with the more vigorous plants like peas and beans. So um, it's shown in the yield that there is. That there is, I know there's another guy who would say that uh, within six weeks, um, nitrogen should start to be fixed, um, after so on. So there's a bit of you know, yeah, okay. yeah, and that may be perfectly fine with, with your beans, beans, but just with the clover, uh, it seems to be that there is no fixation for 12 to uh, 18 months or so. And we went through different phases of the, of the growth of clover. And I've seen trials from like, Scotland as well, which um, tried that as well and didn't find any yield benefit and even slight yield loss. That the night, the clover when it starting off has actually taken some of the nitrogen to grow as well from the ground. So um, that's my theory on it, experience on it. I, I, I stand to be corrected. The, again, here for you, Ross, uh, someone is asking here about how you control insects, especially slugs. Yeah, again, if I do have a slug problem, there are organic slug pellets there. They are um, uh, a ferric phosphate-based, basically an iron-based um, slug pellet. They are expensive, but again, if you have a lot of slugs, you have to use them, and that's it in the story. Because, um, they, are, they are seen as environmentally, reasonably environmentally friendly, um, different modes of action, and they're not going to kill other, other insects in the, in the ground. Okay. Uh, question, have you used the multi-species sword for silage? No, I haven't, but I've heard a number of people who have. I found it quite successful. Uh, it can get quite dark as far as I know. Maybe Mark would be able to um, come in on that one. Mark, have you done that? Yeah, it does be, it does be quite dark, but um, it's really good silage. It does. Uh, if, you're bailing, if you're bailing a paddock that has got away on you, yeah, it's really good. Seems to be. Uh, important to get a good wilt, I presume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dry weather's helpful. Uh, another one, Ross. Um, you mentioned the importance of getting fertility into winter sown crops in the spring. How do you go about this? So, again, last year was probably my first year growing uh, winter oats, but in this coming year now, again, I have no problem probably going out with a slurry tank, or again, you can get um, the likes of uh, dairy sludge as well from Barry Ragged. They are that is um, approved for organic use, which would have quite a lot of nutrients in it, and I find that work. Very well on on both grass and on uh, tillage. Okay. Uh, do you sow the barley with a legume like clover or trefoil? Again, I have tried that. No, not anymore. No, again, I just think. Well, my my opinion is it's a high value crop of oats and the barley, and I don't think you're you're running into possible problems with harvest down the line if harvest is delayed as well. So I think trying to keep it so you know. Reasonably, reasonably take a little bit higher than you would conventionally, um, and again, that will help keep the weeds out, and that's that's all I'd be worried about. Okay, Russ, I think we've my, my train has moved on to, to Flavins here now, so I'll, uh, you're, you're off the hook for a moment. Might be more coming in. So, uh, Johnny or James, uh, just someone is asking here. I understand Flavins have, have capacity constraints, hence not taking on any new suppliers. When do you see this likely to change? Um, I suppose, yeah, we're, um, we are, you know, we, we've had good growth over the last uh, couple of years on the demand side. Um, uh, so I suppose we would be hopeful that there would be some continuation to that growth, but it does take, you know, it does take a good bit of time to, to build markets and to, you know, and try and, and try and achieve that growth. Um, so, 
you know, I, I suppose we're, we're one thing to be mindful of, I, I think as well, is that while we, we did have a record supply uh, coming through to us this year, um, would caveat that with the fact that it was, you know, a very good, a very good harvest, both in terms of uh, yield and bushel weight and all the factors that we mentioned earlier. Um, there's no guarantee that next year will be as good. So we could have the same amount of oats sown and you know uh we we may be able to take in 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 more so i suppose you know it depends on the it depends on the on the year and um you know what comes what comes out at harvest time um but yeah we, we're constantly working to try and grow those markets um you know we we are hopeful that we will get more growth out of the uk um you know, during COVID, I suppose, and, and the, the various different lockdowns that we've had over there, that's where we, we seem to have, you know, uh, grown our business as well, because, you know, other people will have tried the product and picked it up for as new, and, and that seems to have converted into, into consumers as well. So, um, yeah, I suppose it's something that we're working on, um, but but we can't give a definitive answer for uh, for when when we'll have additional uh, capacity. Thank you, James. And just following on to that, uh, someone is asking, what are the products that are creating the big increase in demand? Your export demand. So it's primarily um, retail markets. So our uh, so our main customers in the UK for our organic oats would be. Uh, Waitrose, Tesco, Sainsbury's, and then Ocado and Morrison's. Um, so it, it would be retail packs. So a one kilogram bag of uh, organic porridge yeah. oats or a one kilo bag of organic jumbo oats. They're, they're the kind of main products that we're selling uh, into retail. Not, not really so much into food service um, in, in the same way that uh, Mark and Michal are. Um, it, it's retail is our main business. Okay. And uh, Mark or Michal there, um, someone is asking a question here. What markets have you developed for the combi crops? Um, sorry. Um, we are actually separating the beans from the wheat at the moment and using the, using the, um, the wheat for milling and basically selling the beans separately. Um, there is a great market up around uh, Monaghan and Calvin um, in this area for combi crops to succor farmers um, and basically, you know, for Wainlands and that. It's a great, very good market up right here. So, yep. And that's pretty much. Following on from that, someone is asking what varieties are most suited for organic bread making? Yeah, I'd say um, on that one, it just depends. Um, like it's really up for the mill to try and define where it's putting it because it depends on what the customer wants. And um, there's such a wide variety of flowers out there. You know, you really have to try and work with the mill and find out what they want um, for the type of flower that they're doing. Um, so it's there's a lot of different varieties. Um, you know, I suppose a lot of the Irish recommended list is probably very much geared towards animal feed. Um, so I think you're looking for the things that are in the specs, um, the Hagberg uh, fallen number, the proteins um, and resistance to disease, I suppose, would be really, really important for us um, in organics. Um, so, the you know, the conventional uh, recommended list might just work as well in organic conditions um but mark might be able to give a better steer on that but it just depends there's such a, a huge array of, of of wheats out there um and um it would just depend on what the, the what market is there and, and and who's placing what where because if, if you go and put in a particular variety and there isn't a, a the miller has no outlet for it it's gonna it's gonna create a difficulty so it just it, it, the, the whole chain has got to be managed Okay. Thanks, Michal. Um, there's a question here, I think, Ross, Michal, or, or Mark, my answer is, why not use more seaweed fertilizers? Have you tried them, or any of you? I'm taking the silence. Sorry, I didn't just hear that. 
Sorry, the question is, Mark, there is why not use more seaweed fertilizer? Have you ever tried seaweed fertilizer, seaweed based fertilizer? I have tried seaweed, seaweed uh, spray on fertilizer or spray. Um, I don't know. I know where that question's coming from, but I didn't find, I mean, you need to be probably doing it three times. So you do to get the full. I only sprayed on a bit once and um, that was all I tried. So, okay. Probably one for trials, maybe. Yeah, yeah look, I, I haven't tried. Look, I, I've seen a lot of things you tried and t- tried over the years, and there's so many things, I suppose, because you're organic, there's a lot of compounds you can actually use and put out on it. Now, whether you get a yield benefit, they say there is. But for me, I like to shut the gate and walk away because every time I go into that field, it's costing me money. So if I have to go in with a tractor and spray, first of all, you're knocking it down, you're spraying whatever these, these um, nutrients are on, let them be organically approved. And I don't think you're really going to be winning much in the end. It adds a little bit of yield. It's the cost of it. It's the work that's doing it. It's the trampling down of your crop when you're doing it. Um, for me, I need to see quite a decent yield benefit to make it make it worthwhile. Okay. Uh, someone has said here that they had a lot of red shank this year. Uh, did any of you encounter that? And how did you deal with it? Absolutely. Um, now, I'm lucky enough on my farm, I don't have much. My brother can get absolutely polluted with it. And again, it's just changing from um, a spring crop to winter crops. Like red shank just terminates at a certain week or two in, in March. And if you can, your crop growing before then, in before then, or just again, just switch to winter crop and that should alleviate the problem. It's not uh, really a winter um, crop. Um, crop. Again, the crop, but the winter is up, it's, it's flying at come March when, when um, red shank will germinate. And again, it will be smothered out by then, so it shouldn't have a problem or as much of a problem. Thanks, Ross. Uh, one here for Mark and Michal. Uh, our Irish organic mill seeking suppliers are only milling their own. We're only milling our own at the moment. Um, we'd like to be in the future. Um, we've got a good supply of our own stuff between the two of us um, for to get us started. Like we're only just starting. Um, really, within the last two months, is really only been starting then. So. Hopefully next March is the decision time. So we'll we'll see where we have been at then. But I doubt if next year we'll be taking on anybody. So okay. uh, Ross, back to you again. Uh, do you face any issues from year to year in securing sufficient straw, farmyard manure? Straw or farmyard manure, or are you self fully self-sufficient? Fully self-sufficient. I'm chopping most of myself. Again, I try and chop it um, as much as I can back into the ground. I always did it even before the straw cooperation scheme. And that was a scheme that they paid to 250 euros a hectare to do it. So again, I used to have a lot of cattle. I don't have any cattle anymore. I just found when I had cattle and we're keeping them over the winter, it's an awful lot of ground taken up for the likes of silage production. Paul uh, was talking about earlier with the green leaf symbol um, for, for EU agriculture. Um, if it's if it's from the UK, they'd have to be classified as non-EU agriculture. Um, so so that distinction has come in now because of Brexit. Um, if, if, you, if you're talking about if you're talking about organic oats, um, they, they can still come in from the UK. Um, they need to be uh, logged on traces and they need to be accompanied with a certificate of inspection to, to clear cost. Um, but but yeah, they're. You know, there isn't anything to, to stop uh, organic oats from, from coming in. We are doing oat milk, um, uh, Ross. So uh, we, yeah, it's something, it's a product that we, you know, we felt there was a market for and there was, you know, decent, decent demand for it. Uh, we have three varieties in the market. So, uh, so we have two conventional varieties and one organic variety um and and they're they're yeah they're 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 going they're going quite well um so so probably the we have a barista version which is is probably the one out in front and then i would say the organic one is probably the second uh is probably the second one then um behind it so so yeah it's 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 been a a, a good uh, uh product launch for us is that just in the irish market then is it 
mostly in the Irish market. We've we're exporting a small bit, but not nothing that significant yet um so so really the focus was in the irish market i suppose the our usp is that we're the only um you know product on the market using using you know there's plenty of oat milks out there um and, but we're the only ones using irish oats in in our products you know on a, on a kind of a you know large commercial scale in 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 retail markets um, so yeah so that usp is is strongest in ireland really so uh yeah so. <laughs> Okay, so I just marked then just one question. Sorry, then um, it's just your the uh, multi species sport. I find look, I was actually looking at pictures there for, for, for the presentation, and I saw a fantastic picture of the first year I went in. And after look, I was pounding up after three years anyway, but again, it had pretty much a lot of it had disappeared. Have you found that at all, Mark? Uh, Mark? Was breaking up over breaking up a wee bit. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, loud and clear. Just your, your longevity of your multi-species sport, how do you find yeah. it? Yeah, uh, yeah. multi-species does. The trickery, the planting, it can disappear, but there's a lot to do with grazing practices as well. Um, not over-grazing it, giving it a wee bit longer between um, sort of mob grazing. Mob grazing seems to, seems to extend its life a wee bit, but in the rotation I would have, I would be going back with cereals fairly fast after putting the multi-species in, like two to three years is as long as multi-species is going to last around here. Okay, thanks. Just so on, on that straw issue again, again, you can buy in conventional straw and organic if you're using it as bedding. It can't be fed, but it can be used as, used as bedding, so there's no issue. And again, organic straw, there's no real premium price for it either for that, for that reason. Okay, Joe, have we any more questions? Have we come? I think there's one there on the old main question. Is it answered? Uh, yeah, I think that one has been answered. Uh, there's, what, there's another one here. Um, general query, are there, are there any more premium organic cereal markets coming on stream apart from the animal feed market? I understand Waterford Distillery have no further demand for new growers and for heavens have look to have a limited intake going forward with more oat growers. Um, the you, Ross, the Bort malt is pretty much, they don't seem to be taking on new, new suppliers. No, not, at, to... not, not at the moment. Look, it's a fantastic product that they have and hopefully they will. Like there's a lot of it has, hasn't been sold yet. Like I know we started three or four years ago now having a single farm margin myself, my brother have one batch. And that's, that's what they're doing and they're trying to take on other people. But again, so until they start selling it and find a demand for it, and um, the organic especially, then if the organic takes off, I presume they'll be looking at uh, getting in plenty more growers. There is other markets out there. It's just hard to find them and hard to grow for them. Again, I mentioned the hemp. There's the um, the, the hearts, uh, again, which we use for breakfast cereals. There's linseed. There's, there's a lot of other things that people are growing inorganically. But they're specified or specialist markets. Um, and again, it's something... Um, other people look into there's naked oats as well that people are looking for as well um and again it's just you have to sometimes you just have to go find your market again when we went started off there wasn't much market either and you just have to go looking for them and then they develop over time and if you can get in there on the market and again like faff and say look after you and you're um you're on the you got you get a contract i suppose we should just comment that uh brian o'regan from Irish Organic Feeds was meant to be speaking tonight and unfortunately couldn't make it, but uh, about 50% yeah. of their ingredients would be imported. So there is there is a considerable market there for the the organic cattle feed industry uh, still that has to be to be filled. And I'd say for protein as well, I chatted in the other day because I was looking at uh, buying in some protein. Now look, I'd be looking at probably beans or peas, but I was pricing organic soya, 1,400 euros a ton, I think, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that there's there's one other uh, market that's uh, very big in Monaghan. It's organic poultry feed. But 5,000 tonne of organic poultry feed comes into Monaghan every year. Um, it's coming mostly from Thompson's in Belfast. Um, they would have said that the protein would be too low or some of the wheat or some of the barley that would be grown in Ireland. But more or less, I think they're basically going to settle to import it all the time um it's something we should talk about or Absolutely, yeah. make yeah. 
um, some sort of an attempt to um, get stuff stole, sold to them, like with beans, a bit of protein, wheat. Um, there's loads of ingredients in Ireland that could go to them. Mm. Yep. I think as well, Joe, that, um, you know, I think there is to grow the demand for all of us, um, there's serious investment needed in, in, in marketing promotion. Uh, specifically for organics and um, I think you know we can see th th we can go looking and, and, and try and find places but I think we need um, dedicated uh, promotion and marketing uh, for the sector um, and to get out there and be bold and um, and, and to try and you know push and, and tap into the the consumer's need for uh, organic food for human consumption and um, you know we they, they want it, and they they want low Im environmental impact food. Um, and and you know I suppose as farmers we're not used to going outside the farm gate to promote what we do, because somebody normally comes and collects it. But you know we've got the best story to tell in, in terms of organic uh, and the way we we do business. Um, no fertilizers, no growth promoters, no um, pesticides, no insecticides. No fungicides. We're doing all the things that consumers want in terms of the environment. And, you know, a lot of these things are headwinds maybe for conventional farmers, but they're wins in the sale for us. And uh, we really need um, some strong marketing um, piece to, 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 to connect us with the consumers who are looking for that. Absolutely. Um, some good points there and a good, a good kind of finishing note. Elaine, um, I might hand it over to you to, to close out yes. the meeting. Yeah, look, I think we've had like it's an hour and a half has gone and it's just gone like that. So first of all, I would like to from on behalf of myself and Joe to thank uh, Ross, James, Johnny, uh, Michal and Mark for giving up their time and, and giving us very, very good overview in all the aspects that they're dealing with. So hopefully um, just to say thank you and just maybe just to flag our next webinar, which will be taking place on November the 24th, Wednesday evening also. And what we're going to be focusing on there is organic conversion. And we hope to have a number of farmers that have converted to organics to tell their story in relation to conversion. So that is our topic for November's webinar. So again, thank you to your speakers. And also there's no point in having speakers unless we have an audience. So thank you to the audience and hopefully you all have a better overview of organic tillage options and stay safe. Thank you very much, everybody.